professors, scholars, and students who are watching us. Welcome to another episode of our Orientalism webinar series organized by the Social Sciences University of Ankara, Turkey, or ASPU, as we say in Turkish. I am Filiz Baran Akman, Associate Professor of English Language and Literature. I am also the Vice and Acting Chair of English Language and Literature Department at our university. Now, before we start, I would like to give you brief information about our series. Orientalism Webinar Series is a series of online lectures, each of which hosts a world-famous distinguished speaker on a related field with Orientalism and post-colonialism. In each webinar session, a speaker will give a 30 or 40 minute talk on a topic about their scholarship, followed by a 15 minute question and answer session. During the talk, please send your questions to ospoos at gmail.com. In this series, our aim is to give an opportunity to students and scholars from around the world to become familiar with the trailblazing and cutting edge scholarship of internationally acclaimed academics on critical theories of Orientalism and postcolonialism. Related issues to be discussed include the image of the other, Name the East, Islam and the Turks in Western discourse and Islamophobia, cross-cultural interactions and encounters between East and West in the historical context of the Renaissance and beyond, as well as pedagogical issues and topics related to these fields of study. With the gracious contributions of these important scholars, we hope to inspire more emerging students and scholars to see the rich possibilities of potential research topics in these significant area studies with necessary updates. So it is an absolute honor and privilege for me to introduce to you today's speaker, Professor Jerry Broughton, a world famous Renaissance studies scholar from Queen Mary University of London. Professor Broughton's talk is titled The Untold Story of Queen Elizabeth I, Tudor England, Islam and the Ottomans. But, hi, Professor. So, before, before I leave the floor to Professor Bratton, I would like to read his biography to you, even though Professor Bratton may not need such an introduction, as he has already become a world-renowned scholar with his books on the historical and literary trajectory of East-West relations, as well as map-making in the Mediterranean realm during the Renaissance era. After studying at the universities of Sussex and Essex in England in the field of sociology of literature, Professor Bratton completed his PhD degree in early modern mapping at Queen Mary University of London, where he has been working as a professor of Renaissance studies since 2007. As reflective of his academic interest in mapping and East-West cultural exchanges and encounters, he wrote his first book titled Trading Territories, Mapping the Early Modern World in 1997. This was followed by collaborative work with the late Professor Lisa Jardin, right? That led to a book titled Global Interests, the Renaissance Art Between East and West, published in 2000. Professor Breton also authored books titled The Renaissance Bazaar, From the Silk Road to Michelangelo in 2002, which further elaborated on the cultural encounters and exchanges between the Islamic East and Christian West in the historical context of the Renaissance. His other study, The Sale of the Late King's Goods, which was published in 2006, was shortlisted for the Samuel Johnson Prize. His other famous works include titles like Great Maps in 2014 and the Renaissance, a very, very, very short introduction published in 2006 by Oxford University Press. This eye-opening book, which with its founding argument of a global Renaissance has been an enlightening reference text for those who want to look at the Renaissance time from time period from a different perspective where cultures and peoples come together and collaborate to further science and learning as well as arts and trade. 
his new uh, his New York Times bestseller History of the World in 12 Maps, which was published in 2012, was translated into 11 languages and shortlisted for the Hassel Tiltman Prize. Product of exquisite scholarship, which explores a dozen of history's most influential maps, from stone tablets to modern satellite cartography, again becoming a meaningful plane uh, where a plethora of cultures meet like classical Greece, Renaissance Europe, and the Islamic East. This book won the Book of the Year Prize in Austria. Professor Breton, whose books have been translated into 20 languages, is one of such rare scholars who could also reach out to non-academic readership and audience in a meaningful and informative way. As such, he is a regular TV broadcaster, critic and feature writer for BBC TV channel and BBC radio on topics such as history of maps and Shakespeare. He is also an associate of People's Palace Projects, uh, where he works on a variety of projects in Brazil on subjects of Shakespeare, Utopia, Indigenous and Communities. His most recent book, The Orient Isle, Elizabeth in England and the Islamic World, which was published in 2016, was a Radio 4 book of the week and a Waterstones nonfiction book of the year. Also, as the topic of today's talk, this study, this book was published in the United States under the title of The Sultan and the Queen in, uh, at the, in the same year. Professor Bratton has created an exhibition on maps at Bodleian Library, Oxford in 19, 2019, and is currently writing a book on the history of discovery, which we are obviously waiting excitedly to come out. As his works and academic pursuits show, through his powerful multidisciplinary scholarship, Professor Bratton, weaving history and literature in a meaningful way, has helped us to look at East-West relations and encounters from a different, that is a more amicable and unorientalist perspective. This is important and this sort of like goes to the title of our webinar series. For that reason, his scholarship has been a point of inspiration and emulation for a lot of us, including me, all right, especially for the creation of a more nuanced understanding of Orientalism. As an academic teaching English and comparative literature, so this is my story, uh, Professor, uh, I have been referring to your works, Professor Burton's work in my classes, specifically I consult to his short introduction to Renaissance book as a reference text. The main argument of Professor Breton in this book, which sort of like situates the Renaissance in a global context read like this. And I have brought about this important quotation from your work. So I would like to read this aloud to uh, you and for our audience as well. So in this work, you talk about this global renaissance and then you say trade finance commodities patronage imperial conflict and the exchange with different cultures were all key elements of the renaissance to be frank this is this very idea that professor Breton uh, builds his work on is has been the guiding theme according to which i structured and taught my classes so thank you professor <laughs> Uh, all right. So, Professor, today it's an exceptional honor for me to welcome you in Orientalism webinar series as a speaker whose scholarship has helped us with a more nuanced and um, more nuanced understanding of East and West relations, especially due to its focus on generally ignored historical moments in Anglo Ottoman slash Turkish relations in the Mediterranean realm during the Renaissance era. So once more, I would like to thank you for your time, scholarship and expertise, Prof. Now the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you. That was an incredibly kind introduction. Um, and I'm the privilege actually is mine because what I will talk about um, in this uh, next half hour is the need for this kind of collaboration, which which you both kindly, Feliz and Baizet, have set this up. Um, I'm thrilled because for me, this is the kind of work that I think we must be doing in this field to talk about the revision of arguments about Orientalism, about questions of otherness, about cultural difference, about the simplicity of some division between East and West, which I have a lot of problems with. I'm sure many of you will as well. 
but it's a language that we're using. So I think collaboration, particularly between Turkish institutions and English uni universities and institutions is absolutely vital to how we develop this work. It seems to me quite crucial. As I talk about Anglo-Islamic relations predominantly in the 16th century, I also want to acknowledge that the limitations of, of my own uh, training, you know, if you work in Renaissance studies in the Anglo-American world, you mainly work through Greek, Latin, you know, European vernacular languages, as many of you will know, this does not involve Arabic or Turkish. This is hugely problematic. If one wants to now do this work and develop it, um, I myself, and, and I need to say this from the outset, um, I have very little Turkish and Arabic. Um, there's a point at which I can't take this work any further beyond collaboration, such as with yourselves. And I think this is really, really important because this is part of Said's, Edward Said's argument that otherwise this again is the Anglo-American Academy speaking for somebody else. Professor, we would be honored actually to, you know, if we have such kind of a collaborative work. Well, I think that this is this is really what we, we, we should be doing. And, you know, this seminar is such a brilliant example of that, which is why I think it begins collaboration, dialogue and discussion and further research, because, again, what I'll be talking about is very much the uh, the archival work that I've seen from uh, the English tradition. But you get a glimpse of perhaps uh, other sources, particularly, say, Turkish sources that could lead to further research and further work. So I want to be very clear about that, that I look at this from one particular perspective, but it seems to me this is only the beginning of the work. And there are the scholars, of course, and many of them great scholars, Nabil Matar, uh, Gerald McLean, who I know is also, I think, going to be involved in the seminar as well. This work has already been fantastic, but it seems to me it's just the beginning and it has to be a collaborative dialogic uh, discussion across different cultures, different institutions, different languages. So this for me is a wonderful invitation. So thank you both for setting it up um, and looking forward to the kind of conversations that we'll, we'll have. With that, what I want to do is I'd like to sort of talk, really, I want to, as it were, narrate this as a story. I don't want to go too academic. Uh, hopefully the audience is quite broad. So I want to tell, as it were, a narrative, a story that links together based on the work I did on this Orient Isle um, of Anglo-Islamic relations with a particular focus on Anglo-Ottoman relations, which I think is so crucial to this story. So that's it, thank you. So I'm just gonna call up the, the PowerPoint slides as and when we need them. So some of you may uh, grasp that, you know, the title is deliberately slightly provocative to talk about um, the Shakespearean reference in Richard II to this sceptered isle, a very uh, iconic, idea of Englishness uh, used by Shakespeare. So it was a provocation on my part to say, this is not a purely parochial, insular story about white male English national identity. This is about cross-cultural uh, narratives of encounter, of engagement, of yes, antagonism at times, and at other times accommodation. So the way in which Englishness in this period was developed through an encounter with Islamic cultures and societies. So even I was a little bit unsure about even using that term Orient because it's so loaded with Western ideological imperial assumptions, as I'm sure many in this audience will know. However, this was a way, I guess, to, to provoke and to, especially within the Anglo-American world, to try and make people sit up and see that there was another story about this period. So what I'm going to do is show some images and talk through some of them to sort of thread a story together about the, the sheer diversity and the scale of Anglo-Islamic relations in this period. I'm looking particularly at the Elizabethan period, so from 1558 to Elizabeth's death in 1603. But if I could have the first slide, I'm going to start just a moment before Elizabeth's succession. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to start with this uh, image, which when I show usually in England, people have no idea what it is. Um, I'm sure a more diverse audience here will see that this is a fantasy of uh, an artist called Hans Urth from 1549. And it's a representation, of course, of Sultan Suleiman on horseback dated 1549. A sort of fantasy of what the English imagine uh, Suleiman and the power of the Ottomans at this time represent. Okay, so it is a bit of a fantasy. 
but I'm going to talk about this as an image that takes us to where I want to start this story. And the story starts in Aleppo in 1553 five years before Elizabeth comes to the throne, and it involves an English merchant who's trading in textiles called Anthony Jenkinson. And Jenkinson is working in the Mediterranean, and he travels to Aleppo because, of course, it's the terminus of the Silk Road. And there he meets Suleiman. This extraordinary encounter, Suleiman is traveling eastwards uh, to take on the Shia Persian Empire. Aleppo, of course, is a, a moment of encounter. Jenkinson meets Suleiman. He has an audience. This is extraordinary that he has an audience with Suleiman. And he is granted the first trading privileges between Tudor England and the Ottomans. So this is really quite extraordinary. That moment, I think, for me in the book, is very important for just before the accession of Elizabeth, Jenkinson returns, um, Elizabeth comes to the throne in 1558, he returns to London. He's then chosen to travel back out um, into the Islamic lands. One of the first representatives of the Muscovy Company, who were trying to trade uh, with Persia via Moscow. He travels to Moscow uh, in, in the 15, early 1560s, he meets Ivan the Terrible, and then he goes on to Persia in 1562 to Kazvin. He meets the Shah. Um, he tries to establish a commercial alliance, and it only doesn't work for the simple reason that at that point, the Shah signs for the first time in many years a peace treaty with the Ottomans. As a result, Jenkinson is chased out of the court. Um, but in the accounts, what I found fascinating, and this is something that will keep coming up in the talk, Jenkinson, in 1562, in Persia, is trying to understand the theological distinctions between Sunni and Shia forms of theological belief. Now, this is extraordinary, it seems to me, because we talk about now in the West an encounter with Islam. And I wonder how many people, even professionals, even people working within the field of policy and development, could actually give that fine distinction between Sunni and Shia theological belief that in 1562, Jenkinson is quite openly trying to work out. So this seems to me, again, a revelation that this is going on. Now, Jenkinson's mission to Persia uh, is something of a failure. It's just simply too far. But what it does is it kickstarts uh, Elizabeth as a sovereign who realizes that if she is to survive in Europe in the 1550s, Catholic dominated Europe, as a Protestant reformed leader, um, she needed to reach out to other powers. She needed some other form of alliance against the papacy in Rome and, of course, Spanish imperial power and Philip II. England was a tiny Protestant state on the edge of Europe. What could she do? The thing that she does is she reaches out very strategically to the Islamic Empire. Um, and that's the decision which is compounded in 1570 when she is excommunicated as a heretic by Pope Pius V. And if we could just have the next slide, which shows this is the, the papal bull, the official uh, document which excommunicates Elizabeth, um, that she's officially uh, ejected from the Catholic Church. And the language that's used is that she is a heretic. This is a form of heresy. Catholicism is regarded as the universal Catholic belief system, of course. Um, so what you get is a language of heresy. Now, Christianity, as many of you will know, has never been able to acknowledge at this time Islam as a theology in its own right. It simply sees it as yet another heresy. What Elizabeth, therefore, very strategically does is says, I will therefore conflate my heresy as a Protestant with the heresy that is ascribed to Islam, and I will make common cause with Islam. And this is indeed what happens, this extraordinary understanding of two heresies very strategically coming together against Catholicism. If we can just have the next slide, we can see the kind of icons that if you can see here, this is a the many headed uh, image of it's an anti uh, anti Protestant anti Lutheran German pamphlet, which shows as it were the many different monstrous heads of Martin Luther. 
Now, if you see um, in the center, there's one Ecclesiast, but to the uh, left of that, you see a head of Luther, Luther wearing a turban. So here in the anti-Lutheran polemics of the 1520s, that conflation of heresies, of Catholic propaganda saying Lutheran Protestantism is rather like Islam in terms of its heretical beliefs. That is the way in which Elizabeth understands the possibility of making initially, okay, initially a very strategic alliance, particularly with the Ottomans. Okay, so my apologies that we had a little uh, glitch there. Um, I was just talking about the impact of the conflation between two different forms of heresy, between the way in which uh, Catholic propaganda conflated the heresy of Protestantism with what it saw as the heresy of Islam. And this image of Luther that you see here um, on middle left, the image of Luther with um, a wearing a turban. In England, that kind of conflation is used very strategically by Elizabeth in the 1570s she sends a merchant come ambassador called William Harborne out to, I'll refer to it as Istanbul. Of course, the materials at the time talk about Constantinople, but for this audience, let's say Harborne is in Istanbul by 1578, 1579, working for the Levant Company, another commercial organization, a joint stock company. So he's acting as a trader, but he's also clearly working as a diplomat and an ambassador. He's tasked to establish an alliance with the Ottoman Chancery. The Ottomans absolutely accepted Harborn. He was given Jimmy status as a protected guest. He paid taxes to remain unmolested in Muslim territories. And I think it's fascinating to see the exchanges that we'll see in a moment between uh, Harborn, uh, Elizabeth and Murad III, the way in which Murad's response to the arrival of what he saw as a Lutheran ambassador, was to embrace that multiculturalism. For him, it was the more the merrier. If there were uh, Italians, if there were Germans, if there were Spaniards, if there were also English at his court, that was a sign of his power and authority. So the cosmopolitanism, the multiculturalism, the polyglot nature of what was happening there was something that the Ottomans were embracing in a way that many of the Christian courts, riven by the conflicts of the Reformation, were not doing at all. So with Harbon's help, Elizabeth's merchants began an extraordinary trade through Istanbul and a contraband trade, which involved shipping scrap metal to Istanbul, which was then made into munitions for the Ottomans wars with both the Spanish and the Persians. So again, this is absolutely extraordinary that you have the English shipping arms I mean, talk about the discourse around arms to Iraq and the scandals that were going on throughout the 80s onwards in terms of uh, Western foreign policy. Here are the English arming the Ottomans in a strategic alliance against the Spanish. The metal that was supplied came from the roofs and the bells stripped from Catholic churches and monasteries. So the symbolism of that is, is phenomenal. Elizabeth saying, I am literally stripping Catholicism from England and the materials that are stripped from those churches will go towards the creation of munitions. Um, and this absolutely outraged um, the other uh, Chris, uh, Christian uh, communities who were in Istanbul. And if we have the next slide, this is uh, just a, a, an example. Oh, sorry, I should have shown, obviously, Murad. Um, interesting to see uh, Murad um, because I will often show this within uh, English uh, seminars to say this image is alien to you and it should not be alien to you because an image of Murad should just be as familiar and legible to you as should uh, Philip II, as should John III of Portugal, as should so many European rulers from this period. But indeed, many people look at this um, and are rather surprised by it. Um, so if we then look at some of the uh, documentation, if we could have the next slide. Um, this, um, based on the opening of the trade, um, trade is established. Um, and actually, I'm just going to read quickly what the Spanish ambassador uh, in 1582 says about the trade that's opened up with England. He says two years ago, the English opened up the trade, which they still continue to the Levant, which is extremely profitable to them as they take great quantities of tin and lead thither. 
which the Turk buys of them almost for its weight in gold, the tin being vitally necessary for the casting of guns and the lead for purposes of war. It is of double importance to the Turk now in consequence of the excommunication proposed by the Pope upon any person who provides or sells to infidels such materials as these. In other words, brilliantly, what Elizabeth has done has sidestepped the papal injunction against Christians trading with Muslims. Now, actually, many of you will know that it's a nonsense anyway, because the Venetians have been doing it since the 13th century. So, again, what is revealed in this moment of trade and exchange, I think, as Felice was suggesting, are all kinds of other encounters which are really hidden. And then also a scene in the formal correspondence, which we have here, which starts to take place with Harbon as the intermediary, exchanging letters between the Ottoman Chancery and Elizabeth's court in London, in Istanbul, sending them back and forth. He's the go-between, he's the intermediary based in Istanbul. And Elizabeth writes these incredibly amicable letters to Murad, as you can see here. And the language again is interesting because you can see the way in which she is understanding the theological distinctions, but also superficial connections between Protestantism and Islam, Sunni Islam. So she says, Elizabeth, by the grace of the most mighty God, the only creator of heaven and earth, of England, France and Ireland, queen, a bit of a fantasy because she didn't really rule all those places, but she'd like to claim it because the point is, Elizabeth here is writing as a supplicant to the greater power, to the greater imperial ruler, who is Murad. Elizabeth needs Murad more than Murad needs her. Murad doesn't even really know, doesn't have no notion of who this, who this woman is writing from this small obscure island you know, in the far north. There's no notion of who she is. And again, the field of Renaissance studies has seen this the wrong way around the notion that we've magnified the power of the Christian communities and empires in this period, when as many of this audience will know, the majority of what we would call the old world in this period was controlled uh, by Islamic powers and particularly by Ottoman powers, not Spain, not Portugal, and not the papacy, and certainly not England. And you see here this language of supplication of Elizabeth saying, I want to work with you, but I come as a subject um, I am the most invincible and most mighty defender of the Christian faith against all kind of idolatries of all that live among the Christians. And this again is fascinating because she's reaching out saying Sunni rule does not believe in the worship of icons, just as Protestantism doesn't. Catholicism in that language does. So we both, you and I, reject idolatry. So perhaps we can work together. Um, and those who falsely profess the name of Christ, she's carefully sidestepping the issue, of course, of the religious belief and her own Christian belief in terms of Christ as the son of God, where, as we all know, Islam understands Christ as a prophet, but not as part of some theological holy trinity. She understands that. So she carefully sidesteps the issue and then gives this great honorific to Murad himself. Murad responds with his own letters. If we can look at the next, uh, we can look at the next PowerPoint. I put this up because this is a letter, a response from Murad. It's dated June the 20th, 1590, much later. Uh, the correspondence goes on throughout the 1580s and 90s, throughout Murad's lifetime and Elizabeth's. Um, and I put this up often within the context of uh, an English audience to say, here are letters from Murad that are in the English archives. The, these are in the uh, in queue in the public records office. And these again should be part of our discussion of any global international understanding of Tudor England, of the Ottomans. They have not at this point been part of the story about diplomacy, trade, uh, an exchange between England and the wider world, and they should be, because this alliance is as significant as what England is doing with France, with Portugal, with Italy, with Spain, for sure. Um, so I put this up, which will be more legible for many of the audience who are looking at it now than it is for those, as it were, from an English context. And I think that that's what we need to really try and change. And of course, I also put it up and say, wouldn't it be fascinating to start to think about what the Ottoman archives, beyond what we already know, 
might yield as well in this respect. So this is all again part of what uh, William Harborn is involved with and is managing um, in, Istan in Istanbul. He stays in Istanbul uh, for eight years uh, till just before uh, the Spanish Armada in 1588. He works very closely uh, with the Ottoman court. They refer to him as the Lutheran ambassador. Um, so there's a very specific understanding of the theological differences that the Ottoman Chancery sees going on in Western Europe. The consequences of that embassy, I think, are very profound. Um, Harbon signed the first diplomatic agreement with Murad um, and the Tudor state called the Capitulations. They draw on earlier Franco-Ottoman arrangements, but the Capitulations uh, were, pl were put in place really until 1922, for obvious reasons. Um, Harbon was then involved because of those Capitulations, an agreement uh, that he was subject to uh, Ottoman domains. He appointed consuls across the empire in Cairo, Alexandria, Damascus, Tripoli, Jerusalem, and Aleppo. Um, in the late 1580s, he's encouraged by Elizabeth's spy master, uh, a man called Francis Walsingham, to try and persuade Murad to engage the Spanish fleet in the Mid Mediterranean to try and disrupt plans for what everybody knew was a vast Spanish armada that would set sail to try and destroy Protestant England, which of course it did in 1588. It failed, but I've talked before and uh, really provoked a lot of the right-wing English nationalist belief by saying the Ottomans and their disruption of that Spanish fleet played a part in the survival of the English Protestant state in the late 1580s. And I must tell you that many uh, people on the right wing politically here are not very happy with that. And it plays into you know, the debates that we're having at the moment about decolonization, about looking again at history in terms of colonization, of histories of slavery, and to say, this documentation is there. It's important that we acknowledge it. We can't turn our eyes away from it. There was no such notion of the insular, merry, white, male dominated England of Francis Drake playing bowls and Walter Riley smoking tobacco. This is a fantasy. It's predominantly a Victorian fantasy. And it's no accident, of course, that the Victorian period creates that idea of Tudor England, which excises any contact and exchanges with the Islamic world. Because precisely that period in the late 19th century is when European colonial power is looking at the Ottomans as that terrible phrase, the sick man of Europe. So the narrative that's created about the 16th century um, is one that occludes all those stories and exchanges with the Ottomans. And it's, I'm sure, part of what we will talk about at the end. You know, Phyllis was, we were saying that we would undoubtedly be talking about Said's Orientalist theory. And I think what's interesting is that, and I spoke to Said towards the end of his life about this, um, the way in which we now revise that story that Said tells us, because I remember sitting with him and saying, but I have all this material about amicable exchange between Ottomans and the Tudors, and that actually the power dynamic is the other way around to the way in which you describe it in Orientalism. And I remember he laughed and he said, great, that's wonderful. That's the way in which we can rebuild and retell those stories and finesse them. Um, so that's perhaps another conversation that we can have. Um, towards the end, but we can really carry on this story if we look at the next slide. Again, expectations of the certain Orientalist discourse where materials that we have completely confound that story. This is a man called Samson Rowley. And Samson Rowley um, is a merchant from England, from uh, Great Yarmouth, who is captured uh, by Turkish pirates in 1577. He is uh, castrated, he's converted to Islam, and by the 1580s, he goes under the name of Hassan Aga. He is the chief eunuch and treasurer of Algiers under its Ottoman governor. Now, this surviving image of him, I think, again, is, is such a powerful image of the way in which religious conversion works in this way. And this is very much about um, English Protestant conversion to Islam. It is not the other way. There are many, many stories, and Nabil Matar has done this wonderful work in this, in this field around captivity narratives, about conversion narratives, um, the complexities and the slipperiness of religious belief at this time. And clearly here, Hassan Agar is somebody who is quite happy 
with where he is. Um, I tend to make a bit of a joke about this, that there is correspondence where Harborn writes to him and effectively says, wouldn't you like to come back? <laughs> and Hassan Agar, a.k.a. Samson Rowley, says, I live in a palace. <laughs> I, I'm the treasurer to the ruler of you know, this, this um, phenomenal area. At any point, Protestant England is probably going to be destroyed by the Spanish. Why would I want to come back? So I think we need to think about that in terms of, again, the different sort of stories it tells us that even the Orientalist narrative about the power that somehow the West is already, always already in that deconstructive sense, is always already has the upper hand. This is not the story that we're seeing here. It's a very different story. It's of supplication and subjection from many of these English travellers, diplomats, merchants working with and across the Ottoman Empire. I found only one example of conversion going the other way. This was a figure uh, from 15, 1586 uh, called Chinana, Chinana the Turk, who publicly converted to Protestantism. Um, there is one uh, polemic about this man, and, and you would believe that the entire Islamic world was about to magically convert to Anglicanism as a result. Now, of course, this is a fantasy um, in this period set against the fact that many English men and to some extent women later in the 17th century are converting. Yes, many forcibly, some it seems to me uh, willingly because of the power of Islam in this period um, and as a powerful religion and an empire that perhaps is where you want solace and you want succor. Um, there is a gendered dimension, which I think uh, is fascinating. I talk about in the book that the relations were so amicable by the 1590s that Elizabeth was writing to Murad's mother, Sultana Sophia, um, and exchanging gifts with her, um, including famously the mechanical organ that Thomas Dallam uh, takes to Istanbul uh, in 1599. That's another part of the story. But these fascinating stories that I think also lead what I was trying to get to in the book is the way in which the unintended consequences of those encounters, this is Anglo-Islamic encounter is very much one that's been driven by uh, strategic, political and commercial aims initially. But what then happens as it were on the ground in Algiers, in Aleppo, um, in Constantinople, Istanbul, with people like Samson Rowley converting, with people like Harbon and his entourage, his, his successor um, learning Turkish, people accommodating their cultures, their beliefs, their religious outlooks, um, which go way beyond those official, commercial, political and diplomatic prescriptions. Um, we could carry on and maybe we'll do this more in Q&A and we missed a little bit of time. So I could talk more about the, uh, the way in which the Anglo-Islamic alliance based on what was going on in uh, through Istanbul and with the Ottomans prospered uh, through the Barbary states uh, in modern day Morocco, um, that by the 1580s, the another joint stock company, the Barbary company was working um, from between London and modern day Morocco. Again, the exchanges were very much driven by uh, arms. Arms were being taken out to the Moroccan rulers to arm them in their own conflicts, but also in their conflicts against Spain. Um, the trade coming back into England was Moroccan gold and sugar. And again, I make the nice little point that it is Moroccan sugar. Every English schoolboy is taught and schoolgirl is taught that Elizabeth I has notoriously bad teeth because of her love of sugar. Well, it's Moroccan sugar. It's connected to the Anglo-Islamic alliance and the Moroccan sugar that destroys Elizabeth's teeth is being exchanged for arms, which are also being used by the Moroccans in their fight with other Christians. This again is a story which is usually not told. The intermediaries are usually Jewish uh, merchants who are intermediaries um, in that exchange, adding another layer of complexity to these kinds of exchanges. It's also something which uh, comes back, of course, into England, if we can have the next slide. Um, a rather confrontational slide in many ways. This is an embroidery um, from a stately home, would you believe it, in Derbyshire in the north of England, near where I'm from, uh, which a few years ago I walked into the stately home with my children, covered in ice cream, and I walked in and I suddenly said, why is there an embroidery of what seems to be Elizabeth I and the Prophet Muhammad 
and what also seems in the top right hand corner to be the first representation in English visual culture of a mosque and that the figure of the prophet also has a book called the Al-Quran in his hand. This is from the 1580s in Northern England in Hardwick Hall. This is extraordinary, okay? And what was quite funny is that nobody who worked there could explain to me why this image was there, but it is a sign by the 1580s of the extensive nature of this cultural encounter and exchange that's going on. The trade is transforming the domestic economy of Elizabethan England um, from what people ate to what they wore and even what they said. So you think we know the trade, you know, the sugar, the silks, the spices, the rugs, the carpets that cover all Elizabethan interiors and all the portraiture. If you look back again now, Elizabethan portraiture, and you see what is in effect the trade, the result of trade with the Islamic world, people are literally dripping with it. And we've completely misunderstood that. We've, we've bled out that Islamic dimension to say this is quintessentially Tudor. Henry VIII, all those images of Henry VIII with slash roofs, they're all Ottoman designs. Many of you will know and probably look at them and smile. Whereas, you know, most English people will say that is quintessentially English. It's not, okay, it's not. The materials aren't, the language aren't words like sugar coming to the English language at this time, candy, crimson, indigo, tulip, of course, turban as well. Even zero, zero enters the language at this time, all as a result of this kind of exchange. If we could have the next slide. Um, Shakespeare um, in Henry the Fourth, in Henry the Sixth, sorry, Henry the Sixth, Part One, a play which notoriously very few people ever read. Well, did you know that Shakespeare refers to the Prophet Muhammad? He says, "Was Muhammad uh, inspired with a dove? Thou with an eagle art inspired." Then this is uh, the French king uh, talking to Joan of Arc, but using this idea of Muhammad and the apocryphal uh, medieval Christian story. Um, of course, a fantasy, a lie, but the notion that Muhammad's prophecies came as a result of a dove that he trained at his ear to suggest that this was the, the Holy Dove uh, bringing divine inspiration. So this was a sort of uh, anti-Islamic fantasy uh, from medieval Christian polemic. But nevertheless, here is Shakespeare talking about uh, the prophet Muhammad. This, it seems to me, again, is extraordinary. It's something that people simply forget. If we look at the next slide, we could see um, the way in which the Anglo-Islamic relations then move beyond the Barbary states and even beyond uh, the uh, Ottoman encounters. Um, this is Sir Anthony Shirley, an English aristocrat, who by 1598 was travelling to the Persian court of Shah Abbas and was in Isfahan. Um, we can look at uh, Shah Abbas if we look at the next slide. Um, sorry, oh, this is his brother. So it's his brother, Robert Shirley, painted by Van Dyck in 1622. And again, this, again, many of you would immediately look at this and say this is classic Orientalist portraiture. Okay, but this is from 1622. His brother, Robert, also working at the Persian court as a military advisor. It comes up in Shakespeare's Twelfth Night. Um, this is Robert Shirley returning to actually uh, Italy, uh, to the papacy as an emissary of the Persian Shah Abbas. Two English Catholics who've left England, who've left Protestant England to work for a Shia empire to develop an anti-Ottoman alliance with European Catholic courts. Just try and compute that for a moment. With This is way beyond some very simplistic notion of East and West and Christian and Muslim that we thought might be happening um, in this period. Um, if we then think about the drama of the period, um, it was very nice to have the introduction, which noted that I also write about Shakespeare. And Orin Isle was really a provocation to say all of this material by the 1580s when the English uh, commercial stage takes off, obviously impacts upon that stage. And we just did, we, we in the West just didn't see it. So an extraordinary figure between 1579 and 1624, I estimate that there are no less than 62 
plays with Islamic characters, themes, or settings. Many of them appear in those most influential of plays, Christopher Marlowe's Tamburlaine, which is dated 1587-88, which controversially burns the Quran on stage. Um, his play, The Jew of Malta, which again um, features you know, very prominently Ottoman figures. Uh, Kids' Spanish Tragedy, Peel's Battle of Alcazar. Virtually every English playwright throughout this period is writing Ottoman characters, uh, Green, Decker, Day, Greville, Hayward, Webster, um, many playwrights that you know, people don't really engage with or know about that much, which is absolutely fine. Um, and it does reach a zenith in the 1590s, when I estimate that over 20 plays featuring Turks or Moors, uh, the figure of the Mauritanian figure, we can talk a lot more about that, a very complex, a lot of work that's been done on that, but the figure of the Turk or the Moor throughout the 1590s, it becomes a raging fashion to produce plays with such characters. Shakespeare followed that fashion in many ways. He refers to Turks in no less than 13 of his plays, and many of them are in the history plays, which it seems to be very interesting because they're about you know, questions of political legitimacy and authority and looking to the Ottomans and trying to think about them as a model of imperial emulation. And of course, the reference I showed you earlier in Henry the Sixth, Part One. And Twelfth Night, as I said, mentions the Shirley's uh, represented here. And there's a pun on the way in which the name is used. Um, I come from the north so I flat vowels, so you, you might sort of uh, understand that when Shakespeare uses the phrase, surely, surely this man is, is, is like this, surely he is like this. That was the pronunciation in Twelfth Night, and that's a reference to Thomas and Robert, surely, because that's how their names would be pronounced. Um, I think this is just the last slide that I'd like to look at. I show it there, Shabas. Again, just to again put up the iconography and to sort of say, look, you know, you need to look at the Shirley's alongside this kind of iconography as well. And then if we can look at the fine, the next slide, uh, thank you. Um, and I just want to end with this, um, this figure, um, to tell another kind of story about Anglo-Islamic relations. Um, this, as you might be able to see from uh, the inscription, Abu Lakhad a man who we also refer to as Muhammad al-Anuri, who is the, uh, the official uh, legate, the, the, the royal legate, the royal ambassador from Barbary in England in 1600. Al-Anuri, which is how I'll refer to him, um, is sent by the ruler of the Barbary states uh, to negotiate an Anglo-Islamic alliance between the Barbary states and Tudor England against the Spanish Catholics and also the Ottomans. <laughs> um, he arrives um, in the summer of 1600. He is established in a house on the Strand in central London um, by the Barbary Company. He meets Elizabeth um, on two occasions. High level diplomatic relations are established. There is a discussion about a military alliance. Um, what is fascinating is that it doesn't come off, but it doesn't come off because there's something scandalous about this. It doesn't come off because Elizabeth says that the Ottoman alliance is the far more long-standing version and she does not want to jeopardize that, however ambitious the scale of this Anglo-Moroccan alliance might be. This portrait was painted, I believe, with the assumption of at any moment, the alliance being announced and a deal being done. It unravels, it falls apart. al -Anuri returns to the Barbary States. Um, and then, several months later, Shakespeare writes Othello. Now, for me, I'm not saying that this is necessarily a model for Othello. I don't think al -Anuri is Othello. But this is a high-level figure, clearly a very cosmopolitan, deeply respected figure from the Muslim world. Look at that portrait. Look at the gaze. If we want to talk about otherness, I don't see much sense of otherness there. I see a real challenge in this portrait. We don't know who painted it, it's anonymous. It hangs in the Shakespeare Institute. The Shakespeare Institute endlessly keep asking me to come and talk to them about it because they have no idea why this portrait is there, which just makes me laugh because again of their blindness to see 
the nature of the extensive Anglo-Islamic religious, political, commercial and artistic exchanges that have gone on that create this kind of painting and then go on to create a complex figure like Shakespeare's Othello, who is truly ambivalent, a figure who I don't think we should now embrace and say, this is somebody who's destroyed perhaps because of his theology, nor do I say this is somebody that we should absolutely demonize. The nature of the Anglo-Islamic relations, which have been going way back to the 1550s with Anthony Jenkinson in Aleppo, tell us that this is a much more complicated story, but it's a very important story that's central to our understanding of what Tudor England is. And I might perhaps just end by saying, where did we start? We started in, in Aleppo and we end with Othello talking about his death in Aleppo, talking about how he encounters uh, a Turk in Aleppo and how he does the Venetian states and service. So we begin and we end in Aleppo. And I think we end by saying, we now know tragically about Aleppo and its importance in a way that when I was first doing this work back in the 1990s, I would say to my English students, where is, where is Aleppo? Why is Shakespeare and, and how, why is Othello talking about Aleppo? And nobody could answer. Tragically, we now know absolutely where Aleppo is. And that's why this story, I think, still remains resonant, because it's still a story about, very broadly, a Western encounter with the East, which still has its tragic omissions and its tragic presumptions, and that there is a different story we can tell through history. It's not completely one that we just want to say is about absolute uh, a sort of uh, a contemporary liberal encounter uh, of equality, but it is just one that's far more complex. It's about ambivalence, it's about accommodation, it's about dialogue. And that more than ever, I think, is a story that we need to be telling and we need to be resurrecting from the past in terms of how we think our present. And I think I should finish then, and then we should now move into having a, a discussion and, and, and questions, and you can question me. But thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Actually, the last commentary, and since you have just mentioned about Othello, there's uh, there's one thing that I would like to talk about Othello's, you know, you, you have these videos uh, in which you talk about Othello, especially the, the last concluding words in which Othello sort of like declares himself turning Turk uh, kind of thing. And this is what uh, I make my students watch in Renaissance classes when I am like uh, making them study Shakespeare's Othello. Um, so, Professor, uh, this has been a great delight for us to listen to you. And this is, you know, very informative and enlightening talk about these Anglo, you know, Ottoman slash Turkish relations uh, in the context of the Renaissance uh, time period. And especially this was all the more important because it creates this global, you know, perspective and nuanced perspective, as you have been pointing about, about. Uh, you know, to look at Orientalism from a different perspective. And this is something that I was actually meaning to ask you, but you slightly mentioned and touched upon this important point, like different uh, perspectives that we need to uh, develop when we think about Orientalism. And you all, already talked about your, you know, uh, anecdote with um, late uh, Edward Said, and I was a little bit jealous in that because, you know, <laughs> Um, so, uh, and the important thing, actually, the question that you asked him about, okay, what about these, you know, amicable encounters? What about the positive representations and the images of the other that we see? And this is exactly the same, you know, this is exactly the question that we, uh, you know, if we had the chance, would have asked, uh, you know, Professor Edward Said. So, uh, and um, thank you for mentioning about this important, you know, dialogue that you had with him. Uh, so we are sort of like trying to continue in his footsteps, like to think about Orientalism and then some of the revision, uh, some of the, uh, you know, revisions that we can uh, think about and your work and the scholars that you have already mentioned working in this field have already contributed to such. So we would like to thank you for doing such a scholarship, uh, which sort of like 
highlight this you know nuanced understanding of orientalism this east and west encounters and we have actually learned a lot from your scholarship and your lecture for today's class uh, you know you talked about for instance some symbolic things like henry the eight like clothing and the costumes which are fashioned after you know solomon the you know the ottoman sultan and there's also the other thing that i learned from your book is you know a uh, whole you know painted his you know, uh, portraiters uh, standing on Turkish, you know, uh, rocks and Turkish kilims. Um, and then you talked about Elizabeth's teeth because of lokum, all right? This is the Turkish delight, we call yeah. it. Yeah. So someday you should come to Turkey and, you know, we would like to offer you some Turkish delight there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> obviously, we don't want to, you know, ruin your teeth, but, you that's know. That's fine. No, that's really fine. That's yeah. Fine. Yeah. I mean, you know, no, I mean, you know, ha having spent a lot of time as well um, in Turkey, you know, it's clear to me that this is obviously, as you will know, but it'd be interesting to get, get some sort of other responses as well. This was work that went way, way back to the work from really the 1450s and 1460s and Mehmed the Conqueror and, you know, involving Venetian artists uh, in the in the rebuilding of the city and the way in which, you know, that was part of the European polity, right? And this is, we know, part of the problem. I mean, this is an issue which has moved on over many years, but, you know, Turkey's admission into the EU. And I remember travelling down in the south, um, uh, down near Adrasan, and seeing, just as it were, this most phenomenal breadbasket, you know, a, a, an agrarian world. And I remember thinking, no wonder the right wing in Europe don't want this country in the EU because it's just the, the, the power that's here is, is scary, is scary. And, and, and then you can see that the history tells you that story as well. And that when I was growing up and, and doing this kind of Renaissance work, you know, the, 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 the Ottoman influence was, I used to have this phrase, it was either a fantasy or it was a pure omission. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And even people, you know, working in Italian Renaissance courts are now discovering that, of course, that level of exchange that was going on is far beyond anything that the classical, traditional, late 19th, mid 20th century account of Renaissance studies and the boundaries between these different cultures represented. Mm -hmm. um, and then that becomes a political question. I mean, I think the Said issue is very important because, as you're pointing out, there's been much revisionist work done on sides mm -hmm. and some has been positive revision, which I think is where I sit. And mm -hmm. some we know is very negative and highly politicized. Mm -hmm. So we need to know, we need to understand this as humanities scholars that, you know, the, 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 the difficulty that side had negotiating his political position. Right? So I know for a fact that many of those recent critiques are hugely political. They're massively driven by political positions. They're deeply anti-Palestinian. Mm -hmm. And so this is really important. Mm -hmm. So for me, ideologically, I think where one stands politically, I still stand absolutely squarely with that political project, which was key to what Said was doing. And it mm -hmm. was about the state of Palestine, and it was about a wider understanding of history and culture and what had happened there and the support for the Palestinians. And that continues. So I'm very skeptical, although I know that, of course, we revise what Said did. We, we all revise those great works. They all have flaws and problems. But you don't revise it based on an attack because of his politics. So this, for me, is whenever I see that, I always need to know who's saying it and from what position are they speaking, because you tend to discover that it comes back to a sort of political position which ultimately is probably anti-Palestinian, to put it very simply. And that's, of course, what Said was dealing with throughout his academic career. Yeah. So the politics for me remain, of course, very profound and very important because, you know, in England, the most, you know, I will be honest, you know, these kind of events are the most powerful thing about doing this book. I didn't want to write a purely academic book. I wanted to write a book that could reach out beyond that. And one of the most powerful moments for me is going into mosques and giving this work. And one of the most profound moments was speaking at the Harrow Mosque. I you know, find it incredibly moving. Uh, and a, and a middle-aged Muslim woman saying very kindly, why does it need you to come and tell us this history? 
And it was devastating. It was absolutely devastating, you know, because of the attack that we know is now going on, the, the vicious Islamophobia in this country. And, and, and a lot of the, 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 the critique that I got for writing this, people saying this is scandalous, it's made up history. And I kept saying, no, it's not. It's all here. It's all in this book. I've done the research, OK? It's just that people didn't want to acknowledge it. Mm -hmm. And that, for me, continues to be clearly why we need to tell this history. We need to tell it across many of our cultures, but we certainly need to do it in the UK because of the way in which the British Muslim community feels it's so under attack. And I want to say, this is part of a longer story. Englishness is embedded in these kind of exchanges. It has to be. And that's the consequence, I think, of how we think about Orientalism. We can identify its, its, its forms of exclusion, its constructions of otherness, but I also think those ideas about otherness becomes so complicated, you know, in this period, who is the other? Who is the other? If you're a Protestant, C Catholics are the other. If you're Sunni, it, uh, is a Shia other? Um, but you know, if you're Harborn and you're in Istanbul and you're working with the Ottoman Chancery, who's the other? Is it the Catholics who are trying to kill you? Pr probably, it's probably not the people you're working with in the Ottoman Chancery who may be uh, praying in a different way to you, but they're your friends. Yeah, so that notions about the absolute sort of theoretical idea about the other don't seem to me to hold up here. We have to be just much more complex because now I fear that the language of otherness, you know, we knew this from South Africa, you know, ironically, the apartheid state in South Africa would say, yeah, uh, cultural difference, otherness, absolutely. That's a really good idea. Um, the black community is completely other, so they can go over there. So, it's, it, so now I think, although the language of otherness was being used throughout the 70s and 80s as a progressive term to understand cultural exclusion, I'm not so sure anymore that it's doing that progressive work. And I think we need to be really careful when people talk about otherness, because are they themselves creating exclusions where, yes, we want to acknowledge cultural difference, but we don't want to buy back in to these absolute stereotypes of the other um, it, that concerns me a little bit mm -hmm. um, but that's the work that we move through and on through I think people like side and I think most of the scholars who are doing this work will still say the model of that western imperial construction of a fantasy of somewhere called the Orient still is that is still uh, an important argument to make Mm -hmm. How we then understand it in its localized conditions in the 16th century, the 17th century, the 18th century, so on and so forth. That is another story, but where it's bedrocked on that understanding of power differentials. I think that that has to remain. But from that, we can still do something very interesting with that work. Yeah, actually, thank you so much, Professor, for talking about, you know, Orientalism and its recent, you know, ramifications in our modern day and context. Actually, this was one of the questions that I was meaning to ask you, but you have already answered to this one. Uh, and also you talked about these omissions, all right, that we have uh, in these historiography, let's say, like in, in terms of like understanding the relations between East and the West and, you know, your work and your scholarship, which sort of like highlights this, uh, you know, uh, ignored moments, important moments of encounters, which tell us a different story is all the more important just for this reason, because it helps us to see things from a different perspective and sort of like create this collaborative environment in which people are not each other's throat, but actually they can um, look at the things uh, from a friendly perspective and um, I guess your work because of this like uh, let's say implied uh, argument behind everything you have done is all the more important because of this so we would like to thank you and actually going back to this uh, you know woman at the mosque talking about so you are talking about this history but actually I would like to thank you for doing the scholarship because you know this is hard work and this is difficult work you are going to get lots of reactions and sometimes these are unwanted and fire reactions from the people and this is not 
not just in the Western context, even in the Turkish context, we have such kind of reactions because we are sort of like used to this cultural implications of Orientalism. And for instance, in my Renaissance classes, when I talk about the contribution of scientific, you know, uh, for instance, the idea of algebra and the software, the zero number, how this is like a great contribution to the Renaissance development of Renaissance ideas of the science and learning, people, students are kind of reacted and, you know, they are uh, resistant to understand what's going on because this is not the, this is not the thing that they are accustomed to. So you get a little bit of reaction, even from like the Turkish Muslim students who are learning about these things. Uh, so, you know, we would like to thank you and your scholarship for helping us to see some things that we are not accustomed to. And this is hard work and this is difficult job. So we thank you again. Um, Professor, actually you sort of like talked about, uh, you know, and touched deep on some of the questions that I have listed out for you. But one last question, which sort of like, uh, you know, tie it back to the, our modern context would be, uh, you know, this question, let me read this to you. So in your works and in your lecture as well, you emphasize uh, the often ignored points and moments of encounters between East and West and Islam and, you know, uh, Christian West respectively. So in what ways highlighting these or, or like creating different discourses would be helpful for today's world. So I'm just curious about like your works, uh, you know, connection to our modern day context. Well, one point would be a very localized one, I guess, to what's happening in the UK, which is to say that uh, those different uh, communities, you know, uh, Bangladeshi communities, you know, Turkish communities, second, third generation, fourth generation, you know, British Muslims, I think have felt that they don't have uh, that they have a very shallow history in terms of the context of the UK. Now, I want to say that's not the case. I want to say they they have a connection. We're having a big debate here at the moment about the National Trust, you know, and, you know, stately homes and revealing histories about slavery and colonization. And this is creating a big culture war between right and left. Um, my view is that it's very important to tell those longer stories so that those communities can feel that they, they share part of that national story. That this is not a white, you know, male dominated history. It is not parochial. You know, and this is, of course, has played into so many things that have happened in the UK, like Brexit, for instance. It's touched this idea that we feel that we are an island, we are absolutely isolated. Um, and that, that causes huge damage to many communities that feel their connection to other cultures, other religions, other languages, but who also very, very profoundly feel themselves to be English or even British, right? And so this longer history to say, here is this encounter, here is this going on in the 16th century, for me is very important for today. It's about saying, this is part of your heritage and your history, just as much as it's mine. I'm from the North of England, you know, from Bradford, there were communities I grew up with in the 1980s that were Muslim, that were Hindu, that were Sikh. I felt that they were, you know, there was racism. There's no doubt of that. But I felt that they were part of my stories about what it meant to be English. And that's why I wrote this book. They were part of that story. Mm -hmm. And that history now has to be part of their history. So I think that that's clearly very, very important. I think the other more international dimension is to keep talking about the distinction, um, the, the, the problem of this East-West argument, because you know, a lot of this work goes back to, I remember writing it in moments of 9-11 and 7-7, and the rhetoric around culture and barbarism, civilization, and the war on terror. And I thought this goes all the way back to it's all those stories about the, the European Renaissance. This is about white Christianity as opposed to barbaric, you know, Arabic, Islamic despotism, all those stereotypes of Orientalism. And I just thought this is not what I'm seeing with the history from this period. It's not what you see in late 15th century Italy. It's not what you see in mid 16th century England. It's just not the complex reality of that encounter. So let's stop using it in that way. 
Let's stop creating that absolute distinction. I myself worry about these simplistic terms, East and West. My, my current book is writing about the four cardinal directions, North, East, South and West. You know, what does it mean to talk about the East? The East is, is already a Western fantasy. Indeed, what is the West? The West is a bad dream of, of Anglo-European philosophy itself, right? So we're using them as a shorthand, which I think is important, but I think they also play back in to these big, very destructive geopolitical models, you know, civilization versus barbarism, East versus West. And we all want to, I'm sure in our work say, that's a given that there are communities East and West. East and West are already invented terms within the Western imperial hegemonic structures. That's where they've come from. You know, we, every, all my students talk about the Middle East. I say, what is the Middle East? The Middle East just according depends, to on who? You, it depends on where you stand. Yeah, and according to because, who? Because we are in the Middle East, but, but it's not the Middle East. So. Yeah. Yeah, and so all these presumptions, I think, you know, that's why I think this kind of historical work is so urgently important. Yes, and it's yes. so urgently important to do, mm -hmm. to do it in this way. This is why I'm so privileged to do this. And I genuinely, because I felt that with this work, because of my limitations around languages, around things like Turkish and Arabic, I should retrain. I'm 52, had I enough time. But my view is that we work now like the sciences and the social sciences we collaborate. Ankara collaborates with London, collaborates with Istanbul, collaborates with Exeter. You have to have teams of people who can share their skill sets and share their engagement with the archives, which goes beyond what happens in London or Washington, DC. Right? It has to. It has to do that. So for me, that's why this is a very exciting collaboration, because it has to be about uh, me learning from you, you learning from me, um, and even a wider network than just that. It's not East and West, you know, Ankara, London. No, it needs to have a much wider diffuse network of connections and people's skill sets, people's languages, people's access to archives. And that, through true collaboration, I think rather like the sciences, as I think where this work goes, because you made the point, Felice, it's, it's very hard to do this work. It's hard to do it politically. It's hard to do it archivally. Um, it's hard to do it across cultures yeah right you know we all know the difficulties going on in these regions that we're writing about you know how ridiculous to say yes let's go to tripoli and think about how we do this work oh no we can't can we let's go to syria oh no we can't no, can you we? can't go there <laughs> you can't go there so we know the difficulties of doing this work so my view is that we have to do it collaboratively it's not any good. And I feel I've done this work. I feel now I feel I can't go any further because then if I do, I fall into the Orientalist trap. I speak for a culture. And that I know that's first base Said's argument right from the beginning, that epigraph to Orientalism uh, about representation. You cannot speak for that other culture because that then becomes imperialism. But you can dialogue and that's why we're doing this. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And professor, the work that you are going, you are doing right now, uh, would not have been criticized by Edward Said. This is my, you know, interpretation of this, because you are trying to look at, uh, you know, things that bring people together, uh, and then you are not talking for them, but you know, for these imperialistic perspectives and you know, motivations and things like that. But actually, you are trying to bring out the uniqueness in each culture and in society, in every person. So this is uh, this is something which sort of like differentiates your work and your scholarship uh, from uh, the ones that we would generally criticize uh, about. So, Professor. Thank you so much. Uh, this has been an enlightening and informative, to informative talk for us. And actually the point that you make about this collaborative work to further this discussions about Orientalism is, uh, you know, is a very important point that you are making that we should think about. And um, thanks uh, for your scholarship and your time and your expertise. Thank you. And thank you for setting this up because it's been tremendous. So I hope um, and thank you, everybody who joined in. So, yeah, thank you. OK, bye. Bye bye.